Welcome to Moving Forward, and we're glad to see so many people here. This is great, looking towards what Stafford is going to be able to do in the future. And I don't know about you, I've lived here for about 40 years, and I am more excited about this town right now than, than I ever have been. You know, and I think Jacob Long was kind of instrumental in that, seeing that we could have a bright future. So uh, welcome here, and I hope you've become informed of what's going on. 
Um, I want to, to introduce, uh, well, acknowledge maybe, our first selectman, Richard Chuck, um, our state senator, Tony Bukiomo, and our very special guest, Congressman Joe Courtney, who will, who will be speaking soon. Okay, and um, the other thing is, this is not about the Maple Grove tonight. We have other things about the Maple Grove coming up, but it's, this is not. This is our looking forward and seeing where things are going in the summer. Uh, the seeds of this event were planted this summer when American woolen owner Jacob Long expressed his goal of making Stafford a destination town. When he said that, uh, I was at the meeting where he said that, and it was just like a thrill went through everyone. Could that possibly, possibly ever happen? And I think we're on our way to that actual thing happening. Uh, he couldn't be here this evening, but his goal led us to ask most of the speakers to reflect on these three questions. So this is what they will be focusing on. What was your group, what has your group accomplished in the last year? What are its plans for the coming year? And how does your group How does your group imagine or envision Stafford becoming a destination town? And what might its role be in that? And of course, a destination town, or I should say, again, a destination town, because certainly when we had the Mineral Spring in its heyday, we were a destination town then. So that's what we're trying to get back, being a destination town. And the first to um, speak tonight is Florence Pollins, and she's speaking for the Historical Society. Thank you, Florence. To look at the possibilities for Stafford's future, we should look back at her past. We have the same elements to work with, the mineral springs, the water power, the rail lines, and the rural beauty still around us, all waiting to be revitalized and adapted for the 21st century. Stafford as Kathy mentioned, was a destination 300 years ago for the Nipmuc Indians who came to drink the waters of the springs, which they said made them lively. <laughs> In turn, they told the early settlers who decided that the medicinal springs could cure dyspepsia, rheumatism, kidney disease, and with enthusiasm also claimed the waters would straighten distorted limbs limber stiff fingers, and increase women's fertility. And John Adams, later our second president, visited the Springs in 1771. In his diary, he reported that the journey was of use to me, whether or not the waters were. And the craze for the water cures, the liquid either imbibed or bathed in, seemed to increase for more than a century. Revolutionary General Joseph Warren made plans to build a sanitarium at Stafford Springs, but unfortunately never followed through because he was killed at the Battle of Bunker Hill. The Converse family, uh, the Converse family also of the Maple Grove, <laughs> uh, built its Mineral Springs Manufacturing Company in 1839 and operated a hotel and a health spa at the springs where the water was bottled for what was advertised as the cure for various ills. In 1900, this led to the founding of the Stafford Ginger Ale Company and that they bottled and sold the local mineral water. The early bottled water won a silver medal at the 1904 St. Louis World Fair. The cure-all claims for the springs were unproven but analysis later by the State Department of Environmental Protection showed a content of iron, sodium, magnesium, bicarbonate of soda, and lime. And by the mid-1800s, Stafford's status as a health tourism resort had begun to fade with competition from mineral and thermal springs like those in Saratoga, White Sulphur Springs, and Warm Springs, Georgia. Cleveland Amory's book, the Last Resorts, that was published in 1952, describes us as a resort ghost town. 
and he wrote the, the Little Village of Stafford Springs has the honor of being the first recognized society resort in the country, though it still boasts an ancient mineral spring besides its library. And that library, of course, is now the Historical Society Museum. And you can still sample the iron mineral water in the spring outside the building. And of equal importance with the mineral springs to the town are the rail lines developed in the mid-1800s, connecting Stafford to markets throughout New England. The railroad made possible the mills that manufactured goods for the Union during the Civil War and brought industrialization to a rural area. A, uh, an 1878 map of the town lists a dozen mills turning out woolen and cotton goods, carpets, hardware, and harnesses and passenger service here was dropped in the 1940s. But Stafford had a taste of what used to be and what may be again. In July of 1981, First Selectman John Julian resurrected a, uh, a town tradition of the 1800s, a train to New London, and then a ferry trip for a, bus day, a beach day at Block Island. 500 Stafford residents made the trip on seven antique rail cars that were rented from Steamtown in Vermont and pulled by a modern diesel engine. The excursion trip in 1882 cost $1. 99 years later, the fare was $20. And hopefully, we can have something like that again to build up the community spirit that was shown in 1981. This is a little backwards, but I was supposed to read Florence's bio. And this is one incredible lady, and everyone should know that. Florence Bowen is, rep is representing the Historical Society. She grew up in Jewett City and majored in journalism at Boston University. She has worked as a reporter and or editor on newspapers in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Connecticut. Florence came to Stafford in 1953 when she married Irwin and has since had a finger in many community pies from Girl Scouts, the PTA, politics, and the Board of Education. So, floor it's called. Good evening, everybody. I'm Gordon Preston Elliott. used to be somebody and now nobody. <laughs> <laughs> and happily so. <laughs> but it is my pleasure to introduce someone, a special guest, and it's our congressman, uh, Diane writes me scripts, so I have to read them. <laughs> she talked about, and it, it has to do with the tiger grant, and uh, she would like me to read uh, some uh, letter to the editor by Dennis Milanovich, who works with town, who is uh, a great guy. And he said, the town has been quietly pursuing capitalizing on $8 million in grant monies. The grants bring with it the potential to add back passenger rail service. And that's the $8 million grant that Congressman Joe Courtney has brought to the town. It says, um, a reactivated train station could create a walking public downtown that could support local Main Street businesses and which could help to reestablish Stafford Springs as a destination. Uh, this grant, among other things, is why uh, Joe Courtney is here today. Most of you know Joe. He's been our Congressman for quite some time. He's a great guy. He's, there are 64 towns in the second congressional district, and I don't know how he gets to all of them, but he gets to ours and seems to be more often than others. But we appreciate it. Um, Joe, if you were to if you were to hire a congressman that's smart and loyal and doesn't have an agenda, and to work for you, it would be Joe Porter. So it's my pleasure to introduce Congressman Joe Porter. We've got nowhere to go but downhill uh, after your kind of introduction. And I want to thank Jim and the team that organized this event. And the turnout here, frankly, speaks volumes about people's passion for this community and the, and the vision that uh, I think the, the poster sort of lays forward. And um, 
And uh, I get to at least uh, participate a little bit here and give you a, just sort of walk through this grant, which was just awarded um, in September. Um, is uh, it, you know it's, it's fun to be here, so I, I want to thank you for, for the invitation to, to, to join you. Um, so uh, as, as uh, I said, you know just recently, the U.S. Department of Transportation awarded. Um, uh, through the Tiger program, a, a grant of about $9 million altogether to upgrade a, a rail line, which Florence mentioned earlier, that runs all the way from the Port of New London, actually all the way up to Canada. I don't know if some of you can see this, but we have a map here. Where's Matt? Matt, I want you to hold it up here. You can be like, yeah. Because <laughs> it shows actually, again, that the, the uh, rail line runs, again, from the Port of New London all the way up to Canada. Uh, again, as, as Florence mentioned, I mean, it's been around for a while. I mean, this isn't, um, you know, a new, new track. And, uh, but it is old. And the, um, uh, the track itself uh, from here up to about Palmer, Mass, is owned, uh, is owned by the New England Central Rail Line. They have since actually been purchased by Genesee in Wyoming, uh, which is a freight um, company uh, that's sort of based in, in northeastern uh, uh, U.S. And, uh, and there is rail service, as many of you know, and you can see the trains that sort of come through on, on it, but uh, because of the sort of uh, deteriorated um, state of the, of the rail line, uh, when, a, when a ship pulls in to New London Port and unloads freight uh, in, onto the cars there, they can actually only fill the freight cars up about halfway. The national standard is 286,000 pounds that uh, can go into a freight car. Uh, because of the fact that this old, rusted, jointed rail um, is so um, weak uh, that they can basically only fill the freight cars about halfway. And as a result, obviously, that does a, a number of things. It stunts the ability of uh, the, the freight system to really um, be utilized to its full capacity. And it also stunts the Port of New London. Uh, I mean, that's not a very attractive um, selling point to bring in um, cargo to, to New London if, if, in fact, the, the freight can't sort of move very efficiently uh, on the lines. And also, the speed is, is really um, low in terms of how fast the, the freight can move. Again, some of you have seen the, you know, see this all the time as, as some of the cars come through Stafford. Um, and um, so this, this project that we uh, applied for, the state of Connecticut applied for, is basically to convert the old, rusted, bolted rail into welded rail, which will allow basically to the uh, freight system to, to um, you know, maximize its ability to, to meet the national freight standard of 286,000 pounds of freight car. Um, and the Tiger Grant program, which is what we um, succeeded in, is a pot of money at the U.S. Department of Transportation. It actually was created during the Recovery Act, through the stimulus bill. Um, and it, it sets up, it's a competitive grant um, program where uh, entities from all over the country can apply uh, to the U.S. Department of Transportation and compete for, for uh, getting awards through the, uh, through, the, through the program. We've tried, uh, so stimulus was what, 2009? Um, because it frankly was so popular with states and other parts of the country, Congress has, has uh, extended the Tiger Grant program uh, up through this fiscal year. And, uh, and this, this particular project we've applied for, I think, four out of the last five years. And, and um, again, some other parts of Connecticut got some um, grants approved. Other parts of the country obviously got their grants approved. And uh, earlier this year, as Rich and Dennis and other people who participated in the process can attest, I mean, we decided, you know what, we, we've really just got to, we've got to get our ducks in a row. We've got to concentrate in terms of really making sure that we don't swing and miss uh, again. Because frankly, there are folks in Congress that want to eliminate this program, and, and, and the, you know, the prognosis in the future is frankly quite unclear and cloudy at this point. Uh, so uh, this year, uh, we basically organized all of the communities from New London all the way up to Stafford. We got town governments, we got the chambers of commerce, we got end users who, who presently use the, the, the rail system, but also end users who would like to use uh, rail as opposed to an alternative of, of trucks. Um, to come together as a team, and we put together uh, an application that was like a book that we, we sent down to, to Washington. And we held rallies, we had one down in London train station, which again, Dennis, I know, was there that day, um, to, to continue to generate press 
and visibility around this because we wanted the Secretary of the Department of Transportation to understand that this is not sort of a small group of uh, special interests or, uh, but frankly, it had broad-based support in the public in terms of uh, getting um, the grant approved. So this year, there were 797 applications from all across the country, totaling over $9 billion. If you added up all the applications in terms of what the, uh, the dollar value was, it was about $9 billion. The total pot of, of uh, Tiger is $600 million. So as you can imagine, I mean, this was a, because what happened was the word was getting out about this program over the last four or five years, so more and more people were trying to get it. But, um, you know, we had meetings with the secretary uh, who came to Hartford, actually, and um, uh, uh, Governor Malloy and, and Commissioner Redeker also weighed in and said this is the project that means the most to Connecticut. It, it has the most economic multiplier effect. I mean, when you think about it, it's not the most mega uh, sum of money in the world, but the fact is the value in terms of what it would do to, to grow uh, Connecticut's economy was, um, you know, very um, uh, persuasive. So anyway, um, we, we finally got the call the night before that, um, you know, that we won, that the, that the, uh, the grant was uh, approved. And uh, you know, just so you know, New England Central Rail is going to match uh, the uh, $8 million project. They're kicking in about another $3 million or so. They've actually done some improvements over the last few years or so in terms of some of the crossings. And, uh, uh, and so the, the plan right now is, is that it's going out. Um, it, it, the permits should be issued by the end of this year. By, because the state Department of Transportation has to issue some building permits. Um, and construction will begin next year, and the goal is to have it completed uh, totally by the end of uh, 2015. It's a pretty simple project. I mean, when you think about it, they're just rolling. They're pulling up the old rail. There's about 15,000 uh, railroad ties that are going to be replaced. About 115,000 uh, uh, tons of ballast are going to be, um, again, part of the, the project. But, it, but it, again, it's not really, it, the, the rail line's there, so you don't have to worry about acquiring anything. I mean, it's just, it's just there, it's just we're going we're gonna to improve it. So what does that mean in terms of this region? Well, obviously, um, you know, as I mentioned, end users were, were a big sort of part of the coalition that we put together. We had ag end users, the cough cough farms, uh, you know, who's, you know, has over more chickens than people in the state of Connecticut. They eat a lot of feed every day, so they, they love having a, a rail option to bring in their feed. Uh, we had a lot of timber and lumber um, uh, concerns that are out there that, uh, again, want to ship up to uh, Canada because we've actually got really good wood that we can uh, send up there. Actually, the, the uh, Navy, the uh, electric boat, uh, because of the new contract, they are actually going to be using it to bring in um, materials uh, for their construction. So um, there's obviously in the southeastern part of the state, uh, there was a lot of interest there. But in, in, since the, the grant was uh, approved, the Genesee in Wyoming has been out to the Norwich Chamber of Commerce area there. Their salespeople doing the presentation, uh, with realtors and other folks there about uh, commercial interest that may want to uh, participate in, in you know, switch to, to freight. It's cheaper, it's, uh, it's, it's more reliable according to some of the end users in terms of you know, truck problems that uh, you have to kind of put up with um, because of congestion in the highways. Um, and Wyndham County Chamber did the same thing. They had a meeting with Genesee and Wyoming, their sales force. And, and again, if, if you know, we want to get sort of people that you know, make sense to be in the room with the, the sales force, Genesee, Wyoming, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be here with bells on. And, and uh, you know, obviously they, they have a motive which is a you know, good old-fashioned free enterprise to, to go out there and sell this opportunity. Uh, but again, you know, to learn more and to get more, again, our office would be happy to, to connect people um, to, to sort of take that to the, to the next level. As far as passenger rail, which I know is sort of what I think a lot of people are, are curious about, I mean, again, the, the, if you look at that line, so in the state of Vermont, which is obviously has the biggest piece of it there, they actually have already done their upgrade. They did it. They actually got um, a, 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 their own uh, stimulus grant to, to upgrade the, the line. It wasn't through Tiger. They just got a straight grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation about three or four years ago. So that rail line is good to go in terms of uh, having an upgrade. The state of Massachusetts has, has started work on it, and they actually are going to have some state, uh, their own state DOT funds to, to, to uh, uh, get the, the, the line upgraded. So uh, really, by again, Within the next year or two, you're going to have a, a line now that is really going to be up to date and modernized in terms of handling weight, uh, weight um, all the way up to the Canadian border. Passenger rail, obviously, and some of you know this a lot better than I do, we've been around a while. I mean, frankly, there's 
a lot more to it in terms of safety, um, you know, uh, installations and equipment that have to be included in that. And, and that's obviously the next step that um, people are going to be uh, focused on. The state of, of Massachusetts Department of Transportation is actually going to uh, has actually already got planning right now for a passenger system. The, um, there's a coalition of folks in Stafford's part of it. It goes back a couple of years ago, the Central Corridor Rail Line, which is what they want to call this. Um, if, it, if, it become, if you can get it up to you know, the passenger service uh, level. Um, would, it, and the, the, um, you know, the, the vision is not that it would necessarily be high-speed rail, kind of like what they're talking about with New Haven up to Springfield, but we're talking obviously, you know, passenger rail that would move 60, maybe 70 miles per hour. If you look at the line, um, you know, starting in, in New London and up through, um, you know, stores, up through five college area, it's kind of like the college corridor in terms of uh, colleges and universities that would nicely sort of tie together. Uh, but obviously there's other, um, you know, I think uh, passenger drivers that you can sort of, uh, I think, imagine in terms of uh, tourism. Uh, and certainly along the coastline, and, and obviously Stafford too. You know, um, you know. But this is—I don't want to oversell this. This is, you know, this is going to take, um, you know, more work of us getting it there. But obviously, getting this Tiger Grant, upgrading the rail line, is a huge first step in terms of, of getting a, an old rusted line sort of pulled up and replaced by uh, modern welded rail. And um, and I'll just say, you know. Um, it, you know, we worked hard in terms of getting the submarines, which are, you know, hundreds and millions and billions of dollars, or anything like that. I mean, when you look at the price tag of this, it's relatively modest. But I will tell you, the excitement and enthusiasm about this grant, uh, all the way up and down, is just, it's really been just quite remarkable to me, anyway. It's just that people get it, you know, that, that um, we still live in the most densely populated part of the country. I mean, even with all the people saying, you know, people moving out of here. I mean, the fact is, is if you drop a, a, a point in Hartford and draw a 100 mile circle, we are still the most densely populated part of, of our country, and um, rail still makes a heck of a lot of sense. Amtrak from Boston to Massachusetts is the most profitable part of the whole Amtrak system nationally, and, um, and, and I don't have to tell people here, I mean, you know, we, we um, you know, driving and truck traffic and everything is, is not the most pleasant experience in the world. Getting tr more trucks off the road and giving people more options in terms of uh, their own sort of uh, uh, passenger uh, option, I think is, is something that is extremely popular. But it's going to take a lot of work. And, and the good news is, though, is that I think we've really got a, a nice coalition of all the communities and the chambers are, are just cheerleaders in terms of uh, trying to, to get this thing moving along. And, um, and you know, look forward to, to coming back here when, when you know, we've got nice modern rail and, and then you know, we'll roll up our sleeves and, and take it to the next level. So anyway, that's the update. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. I was thinking we should start an energy committee. 
I'd like to start an interview. Would you be willing to help? And I said, all right. And just better make sure you don't get me into any trouble. So here we are, and uh, we're off and running. And back in 2010 is when we, when we started this. And the first thing we did was we had we got Stafford on a uh, uh, clean energy communities program in the state of Connecticut. That made us eligible for a lot of grants, and it also made us eligible for uh, CBEC programs and those kinds of things. Probably a lot of you have already heard about some of that. Uh, after that, we uh, sponsored an energy fair at the high school, uh, and then uh, we found a company that was giving away free solar panels, free solar arrays to towns. And we got them to come out, and we wound up with three free solar arrays, uh, two at the West Stafford Fire Department and one at the Stafford Library. And some of you have probably seen all of some of those, most of those anyway. Yes. Thank you uh, for inviting us here to, to, so we can talk about what we've been doing for the town in the last five years as, as far as energy. And uh, Chris and I are going to kind of uh, tag team this. Uh, um, some of the different projects that we've been working on, he's been more involved in and, and vice versa. Uh, after uh, we got our free solar arrays, we, um, we, we started looking around for an energy services uh, a performance company that could help the town um, try to uh, help us save energy. And uh, we, we did some research and uh, we ended up uh, narrowing down our choice to Honeywell. And uh, we did a $1.7 million project with Honeywell to save uh, electricity and, and oil, heating oil for the town. Uh, we entered into an energy saving performance contract with them. And um, they guaranteed us a certain amount of savings. And uh, in the first year, uh, it's been just about one year since we've uh, had this in place, uh, and we've uh, saved well over $100,000 in energy uh, costs. Um, for doing these upgrades, uh, Connected Light and Power uh, gave us rebates uh, in the amount of $300,000 uh, for the lighting, and, uh, uh, mostly for lighting and, and other uh, energy uh, saving upgrades that we've done. Um, so, so that is in place. Um, it's working very well. Um, you know, there's, there's more that always can be done, but we, we took the, the, the lowest hanging fruit on this. Uh, so that, that's been complete. Uh, and while that was going on, we um, also found out about some grants uh, from the state of Connecticut uh, for a solar thermal. Uh, so we uh, worked on that, and uh, we received about $60,000 in grants for uh, solar thermal hot water systems. Uh, we have one on each of our schools. We have five solar hot water systems. And uh, this uh, takes up the demand for about 70% of uh, the hot water for, the, for these schools now. Um, and so that's up and running. And um, after that, we, um, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Butch. And this is uh, his, his failure right now. OK, um, after we got. Well, some of these projects actually started in coordination with each other, but or at the same time anyway. The next, the next one we, we started working on was uh, we wanted to put some solar arrays on some of the schools and so forth. So we uh, we researched several solar contractors, and uh, there were probably five or six of them we looked at, and we finally uh, wound up with Ross Solar. We recommended uh, Ross Solar to do this. And we uh, wound up being able to put on 610 kilowatts on three schools and a community center. These lights here are powered by solar, by the way. Uh, and they're large enough so that, of course, they're, uh, they're powering the municipal buildings. But to give you an idea of how large those are, uh, it would be enough to power 125 average homes. Uh, so that's that's a, that's where uh, that was quite a bit, and we uh, went on from there. And Gary's gonna do the next one on the process. Yeah, uh, this, this is a this is a project that is a uh, work in progress. Um, we we secured uh, Z Rex for uh, approximately another 367 kilowatts. Uh, that's that's enough to power another 75 homes if uh, if you were going to power homes with it. Um, and, and this is going to be a couple of carports. Uh, one will be at the, the town hall, and uh, one will be at the middle school. And we're going to get more solar on this, this building here and a couple of other buildings. Uh, so that's uh, the 
negotiated right now with Encon Solar. They're, they're the contractor that was selected for this project. Um, and uh, and then uh, so the, again, so that that's a work in progress. And then um, another thing that is uh, that we did was a uh, this was targeted at homeowners. We did a solarized staffer initiative, and again, this is a state-sponsored program where um, we try to get the homeowners in, in the town interested in putting solar on their house. And uh, it, it was uh, it worked out pretty well for a town our size. We got 45 homeowners to put solar on their house, and uh, those pro those installations are just finishing up now. That that was a project that started about a year ago. Um, and, uh, and then one more uh, thing that has just been completed is uh, we, we received a grant from uh, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection in uh, Connecticut Lake and Power uh, for an electric vehicle charging station, which uh, was installed at the town hall last week. Um, it's in a temporary location. We, we, we kicked uh, Rich out of his parking spot for a few months until we get the carport up, and then that's going to be moved over to the, uh, to the carport. Um, and again, that was 100 percent paid for by grants. It didn't cost the town a, a, a penny. Um, and uh, you know, so that, that's that's about what I have, and I'm going to turn over the, the last thing to Mr. Bush. Our, our last and current project is uh, to be. Oh applied for a lot of solar, and we got ZREC awards for uh, three different arrays. Um, it's 8.8 .8 megawatts that will be going on the landfill, and two megawatts behind the uh, middle school on town-owned town property. Uh, also, in the same program, we put together uh, a program that would convert the uh, high school, the middle school, and the elementary school, and the library to geothermal. Uh, that would eliminate, almost eliminate, the oil bills of those buildings. Um, the total is, uh, of those is, is just over, somewhere a little over four megawatts of electricity will be producing with solar. And when it's all up and running, it will produce 90 plus percent of the town of Stafford's electrical requirements just from solar. That's all a municipal building that will be applied to. Um, and the savings are projected to be in a neighborhood of $9 million over 15 years. And just to give you an idea how big those rates are, it would be enough to power uh, in the neighborhood of 900 average homes. And so um, I think that uh, the other part of this is that if we're, if this gets completed, there's one more step in this process that we're waiting for a CNLP. And if, if that's awarded to us, uh, this could put, make Stafford uh, in the, the, somewhere around the fourth or fifth town in the entire country that's able to accomplish producing this much energy providing this much energy from uh, solar arrays, from solar, and clean energy sources. Uh, there's, there's one more thing here that I'd just like to say, and that is, we didn't do this alone. We have Peter Kowalski back there, raise your hand for me, please, and Gene Gilbert. We have a new member, I don't know if he's here, is Bruce Carrier. Here? Bruce here? No. Well, uh, Bruce uh, is our latest member. He was appointed by Rich, and uh, thank you for that, by the way. He's a great guy. He's doing a really good job. Uh, so that's, that's where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is um, Cheryl Wilson Maynard, and she is the chair of the Arts Commission. She's a lifelong resident of Stafford Springs and attended local schools. She's a graduate of the University of Connecticut and is currently employed by Mass Mutual as the Director of Marketing and Communications. Thank you, Cheryl. Good evening, and uh, thank you for having me come out and talk about the Arts Commission, one of my favorite, favorite topics. Um, Community. 
pleasure to work with 11 of the most dedicated, creative, passionate volunteers um, that you could ever find. I mean, the most hardworking people that I, I think I've met. Um, Paul McEnany is here among them, and I don't know who else is in the audience. Um, so in my day job, I'm always challenged to think about what the so what is, right, as a marketer. So you can know, write a wonderful article, but if there's nothing compelling for the reader, why would they read it? And when you think about, you know, a buyer, encouraging them and compelling them to part with their money or their time to purchase your product, you really need a strong so what. And so I think when we look at Stafford, we have a wonderful community, we have amazing scenery, and we have a vibrant downtown that's just getting better every day. And so we have a really strong proposition for visitors or individuals that are thinking about living here. So I think that's something to be really proud of. I think when you look at the Arts Commission and some of the other groups in town, um, local businesses and so forth, I think those are the individuals that are really making that proposition that much stronger. So next slide, please. please. So on this uh, slide, there are three things um, that I'd love to have you take away. Um, just you know, encourage you to, to like us on Facebook and, and attend our events that we'll talk about in, in a few moments. Um, I'm also going to share how we get the word out. And then finally, talk about how you can help before you thought you were going to leave here and not have to do. Um, so first and foremost, our summer concert series. So every summer, we host six concerts in Hyde Park. And uh, as a group, we all select the bands that will play, and we really look for um, a mix. So this year, we had reggae, we had blues, um, we had uh, a wonderful acoustic acts. And, uh, all of those events were attended, um, many of them by well over 100 people. And right now we're starting to plan for the events that we'll host next year in the park. And we're hoping to have that amphitheater there that we can uh, leverage for that. Um, finally, our, for our winter events, um, previously we used to host a concert series. Um, our group decided that we really wanted to take um, an opportunistic approach to um, winter entertainment. Um, so we have a free con a concert coming up uh, this Saturday night at um, the Museo Townhouse, and it begins at 7 p.m., and we're featuring Kristen Graves and Glenn Roth as the two artists. Um, we're also working with the Civics Commission, so the Arts Commission will be uh, hosting a movie for the Winter Festival. Um, and we're working towards planning events out into January and February as well. Um, some of the ideas, puppet shows, and uh, as well as even one idea, which is hosting a silent movie night and inviting musicians to come in and play a lot. So we're trying to be very creative, very innovative, um, and we hope that to see all of your faces at our events. Um, also, throughout the winter, we host a third Saturday Barn Dance. Um, one of our members, Rich Sarvadella, is an amazing uh, uh, square dance caller, and he brings in live music. Many of these events, he's had as many as 80 individuals at the Memorial Hall. Um, so it's a dance that started at 7.30, small donation, and uh, it's really amazing. Um, I've been to many of them, and I'm always surprised at the mix um, of individuals that attend, many under 20. So, <laughs> far as we coming back. Um, also, this past fall, we hosted the Stafford Arts Festival, also in Hyde Park, so we brought in artists who um, were selling their wares. Uh, we've also had children's, children's events, drum circle, lots of music. That event was well attended as well. And ultimately our goal is to look for opportunities to um, leverage activities that are happening um, already in the area. So I think that as individuals drive through our town, the more excitement, the more noise, um, it just brings more people in. Um, our spring event, right now we're planning uh, the spring event, but last spring we held a concert at the Palace. We uh, featured a caravan of thieves along with an art show. We had a drum circle out in the park um, along Main Street at Haymarket Commons. And also, we're really looking for opportunities. As I pointed out, we're working with the Civics Commission on their, you know, working, helping them with their winter festival. Um, you know, we're really looking for opportunities to schedule our events when other things are happening. So I think there's a strong opportunity for continued collaboration. So one of the ways that we've been getting the word out um, to spread uh, word about our activities to our local community as well as beyond, we're really leveraging uh, social media, Facebook. We have a Facebook page, which I would encourage you to go out and visit and like. That will keep you up to date with all of your events. We're also leveraging the Stafford Bulletin Board, uh, the reminder. Um, we've attended, um, we've been at Wyndham Arts 
putting in part of their newsletter, as well as even um, appearing on the WILI radio show to talk about our spring event. So we're really leveraging as much um, marketing activity as we can to get the word out. So the ask of you. <laughs> so the Arts Commission meets uh, the first Tuesday of every month. Um, and I would encourage you to come in, come down to town hall. You're welcome to, you know, attend any of our meetings, bring your ideas. Um, you'll find our agenda on the town website, both ahead of the meeting, and as well as after the meeting, uh, you'll be able to see our minutes. So uh, I would encourage you, all of you, to share your ideas and get involved. So thank you for your time. chair since 2000. She's been a Stafford resident since 1990 and worked in proposed nuclear waste dump in Hyde Park. Ingrid is also a founding member of the Open Space Advisory Committee to PNZ and co-authored Stafford Plan of Conservation and Development. She currently serves as registrar of voters and is married with horses and dogs. <laughs> Not two horses and dogs, but with horses and dogs. <laughs> last night, so the Arts Commission doesn't know anything about this, <laughs> but one of the things that we talked about was using some of our trails, most particularly the trail behind the Witt School in, in my park, and setting up a sculpture trail, a sculpture garden trail there. And I had talked with Georgia, uh, Mike Lick, about this years ago, and it never got off the ground because of budget constraints and you're trying to tie it in with the autumn in the park, and it just never happened. But um, we talked about it last night, and we would really like to resurrect that. We 
top of that, um, we have wonderful places to walk, and there are a lot of places to walk in Eastern Connecticut. But if you want to do something different than just go for a hike on a beautiful piece of property, go see a sculpture garden. This could be a permanent thing. It could be a summer <coughs> series. It could be something like that. So that's what we were thinking um, from the conservation's perspective of what would be a good thing in addition to trying to get the town bike trail system off the ground. So, if you have any ideas of what you would like to see or what you would like to have done in this town concerning the environment, we're a fun group. <laughs> third, third Wednesday, we have the town hall at 6.30. Uh, the way we operate is if someone comes with an idea, um, they run with it and we help them. And we've always worked that way. So anybody who has a great idea for something to do with the environment, let us know. That's a conservation question. Um, two other committees that I served on were advisory committees to the planning and zoning. And one was the open space advisory committee. And that has not been active for a few years because with this bad economy, nobody is developing subdivisions. And that was our purpose, was to go out to the field and do the work for planning and zoning to look at features that um, we thought maybe should be protected and to advise them um, in that capacity checklist, you know, big trees, vernal pools, stone walls, unique features, um, different wildlife habitats. So um, it was a group of us and we did that and we would go to planning and zoning and they would make the final decision. I also worked on the cool. town plan and I don't think anybody else has been here tonight that worked on that. But it took us, a group of us, several years of a lot of a lot of meetings and a lot of hard work to come up with a plan for the town. And I encourage all of you to check it out if you are if you haven't already. It is on the town website. It's on the uh, planning or the zoning and building department. You can go down at the bottom of that and you can open up the plan and you can see all of the things that we were thinking about that would be good for the town. Things to uh, protect the environment, to increase development, <coughs> pardon me, increased development around the borough and leave the corners alone. Our wealth in Stafford, I believe, is in our land. We are not like other towns. We are not like Enfield. We are not like Vernon. We are not even like Collins, thank God. <laughs> so, so, we have managed to do this somehow without having a plan, a real plan for protecting our environment. We've done it because we have a few large landowners who don't want to get rid of their land. Most of the town is owned by just a few people. Very large landowners own most of the town, and none of the land is protected. It can go anywhere, it can do anything. Now there are people who are actively trying to protect their land. And they're, but they're doing it with the state and with the federal government and with the local land trust. But that's something going forward that, that the town really has to think about. It has to think about how do we want to develop it. Let's not lose our most precious resources of forests and farms and clean water and brook trout and porcupines and bears. We <coughs> have these things that other towns don't have. And this is something that is uh, it's important. It's important to have those things. It's, it's one of our treasures. And I would really hate to see it go down the toilet with another subdivision or another big shopping plaza. You know, I, I would really hate to see that. So, the plan also talks very specifically to the planning and zoning department to think about, seriously, think about things like ridgeline protection. Some other towns, you've seen it. You come from Enfield, you look up into Summers, and you see all those houses there. Who wants to look at that? 
Well, so far we have one in this town that everybody has to look at. And it's only a matter of time before we have more. Planning and zoning has to look at these issues. They have to, they have to address them. So, why did I bring up one commission and two committees? <coughs> I know that the focus of tonight is not talking about the preservation of historical structures. However, the Plan of Conservation and Development has advocated for a historical commission that is appointed to advise the Planning and Zoning Commission on such matters. We've had, over the years, we've had several issues where archaeological sites, historical sites, have been threatened. And if the uh, Planning and Zoning adopted an advisory committee as they adopted the Open Space Advisory Committee, as they adopted the Plan of Conservation and Development Advisory Committee, they could also adopt a historical committee to help them. The people who are on planning and zoning work long hours. They have a lot in front of them and it's serious business. They are making serious legal decisions for the town. They need help. So that's my, in closing, that's my final recommendation is that a historical and archaeological commission be adopted. Thank you. Thank you. 
this year. Um, so it's, uh, it's coming kind of full circle. Um, and just to tie into what Ingrid was talking about, uh, the land, you know, the, the, this not-for-profit entity that we are, we lease the land from a local farmer. And we're, um, we're paying a, what I would consider a reasonable fee, but it's certainly not capable of competing with the commercial development. And what makes that possible is that the farmer has sold the development rights to the Northern Connecticut Land Trust. So that we're able to come in, get a 10-year lease, and, and pay for roughly $1,000 a year to grow vegetables for 52 families. Um, and it's, it's enough to meet all their needs, and it's organic, it's digging on the dirt. We bring people out there, they participate. Um, and we have uh, a mission to, uh, to educate and to have fun. So, so you can <laughs> get to talk about the fun. <laughs> so it's a fun part. Um, I, I am not a founding member, but I've been a member for three years and I really appreciated um, being able to get fresh produce every week during this spring. Beginning in the spring, it usually kind of adds up in the summer, we get more and more vegetables, and then by fall, in the past couple of years, Kind of amazing the amount of, of vegetables that we've gotten for each share. So our jobs as members are to work for two hours every two weeks. We have a, a schedule, but it's fairly flexible. If people if something happens, they can make up their time. And we also have a couple of work days during the season where everybody comes out. And what we do is work for a few hours, and then we have a really nice potluck lunch. So we all get to eat really good food, share recipes. Um, there, are, there are vegetarians among us, there are non-vegetarians, and we all manage to find really good things to eat. Um, we also want to encourage families. We have a lot of families that are members. Um, Charlotte said families are members. Um, a, lot of, a lot of kids of all different ages learn about vegetables, what they really look like, as opposed to what they look like in the grocery store with plastic around them. And, um, and the kids are actually quite good laborers as well. We believe in child labor. <laughs> but it's really nice to have them around and, and um, to be part of that. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else. Is anything else you can say? But we're always looking for members. We're happy to, happy to have anyone who's, who would like to come. I think um, what Charlotte was saying earlier is really important that we're, we're not like other CSAs in that we really want to be, we're all participating in gardening farming. We, we're all learning, we're, we all get our hands dirty, and uh, we think it's a good thing to do. So, and if you're interested, we're always looking for, for additional members. So um, I met Mickey Limberger, who is the owner of a, a basically a hundred acre farm up on Pepper Road. Um, it used to be uh, the home to 200 breeding animals. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, that's like an amazing number. 
I see a lot of small herds around. Um, why isn't it today? And uh, his response to me was um, that his father sold wholesale. And had he found a way to um, sell retail or network or connect with the local market, um, the farm might be today. So we sort of set out to develop a model that would um, hopefully bring back farms like that and, um, and grow up other farms. So we came up with this name, Kinetic Farm Table Cooperative, which aims basically to, uh, to network to the local farms. Um, I'm a public speaker. <laughs> so, in short, uh, what we do is we run a year-round meet CSA, all right, which is basically broken up into four-month blocks, uh, which people can purchase shares um, at a discounted rate. It's, uh, it's convenient for them. It gives them a way to support local farmers, um, know their farmers. Uh, there's currently six farms involved in that effort um, to bring locally produced meat, poultry, pork, rabbit, goat, uh, and beef. Uh, Bob White, uh, Bob White's farm is one of the uh, supplying beef farmers. Um, he raises uh, grass-fed grass and his Angus. It's very nice. Um, we also run a farm stand at Mako's Lot. And I thank uh, Mr. Mako for allowing us to do so. Um, he's very generous with that. He doesn't charge us any rent. He really wants to see Stafford farmers um, succeed. Um, so, what else can I say here? Uh, there's a... I see Stafford as a, uh, a place where if we take the next step from meat uh, cooperative into an overall cooperative of um, crafters and other vendors, you know, people that go to regular farmers markets, um, if we can network that um, and make the products available uh, through one channel, um, through a website, through a store, through a general store, um, that that would be a good thing for everybody involved. Um, right now, that's one of the major uh, problems in my mind with um, <coughs> sourcing local products is, is if people don't know where to go. People want pork, they have to go to one farm. People want beef, they have to go to another farm. You want to support potters, you're going to a pottery studio. Um, farmers markets are great, but they're open one day a week. They're open for three hours. Um, we need, if we want to support community agriculture and community producers and crafters, we need to make products more accessible. And uh, I guess that's, that's really what we aim at, Mickey and I, to develop these things. We're trying to make these products more accessible to everyone. So, um, I'm not sure what else to say here. <laughs> not a public speaker, more of a farmer. But, uh, I've seen a lot of your faces at uh, my farm stand, I thank you. Um, and, uh, who's the next speaker? Uh, Luis. Uh, Luis. Representing the Main Street Business Group. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I want to take a different approach in how I present and represent the uh, my group, the Main Street Business Association. I'm going to take the approach of telling you a story about me coming into town. I know that a lot of people here that have come talked about from the inside out. I'm going to tell you from the outside in. And what I mean by that is that um, in 1991, I went to Spain for a vacation, and I met a group of farmers that were harvesting out. The moment I ran into them, I fell in love with house and the outdoor. I knew that one day I would be able to uh, combine my two passions. The olive oil and art. I just needed the right time to do it and the right place to do it. Three years ago, I drove from Summers to uh, Starbridge, and I drove by this little town that I've never seen before. And right away, that dream that I had forgotten, I want to say forgotten, but more like put away, came right back. And I said, I found the place. At that point, I didn't know why, but there was something about Stafford that said to me, this is the place to come. I came. And the first thing I met was uh, a group of people that were uh, running businesses in Main Street. And right away, every time I interacted with people in the town, it kept saying to me, you're doing the right thing. 
keep moving, keep moving forward for your dream. And that happened every single day. I met members uh, of uh, businesses in Main Street. They basically rolled red carpet and said, come on in. And I felt like I was part of the family, what I didn't have in the business here yet. Uh, all the people who were very instrumental, uh, Howard Buckman, basically I went to meet him. I said to him, I am interested in your space. I went up in a store, and he, said, he met me once before, and he basically said, all right, let's do it. So someone who's never met me opened his arms and said, come on in, open your business. Um, so we keep talking about Stafford being a destination time. Um, we are that already. I feel that we are because we have a lot of those uh, components that makes us a uh, destination town. And one of the components uh, when I came in was that when I met people, in, in especially in the downtown area, they had to drink to have a business right here in downtown. As I understand, it was town, uh, Main Street that five, seven years ago, there's not much there. Um, so I meet a group of people that have a dream to say, you know what, I'm going to open a business in, in Main Street. Um, choosing Main Street as a location, provide, they all have something in common. Providing good local or quality products to, uh, to the people, not only from Stafford, but people also coming uh, outside of Stafford. Uh, pride. <coughs> I value pride a lot. And that is probably why I saw the most and what kept telling me you were in the right place. People were proud of what they were, they had, what they were doing. And again, I'm referring to members of the, the business owners in, in Main Street because they were the first people I met. They had pride. Uh, Mr. Buck, uh, Buckland, he just had pride. I never seen somebody with so much pride when it came to a town. And that really said to me, you know what? He's, he's the right one. Uh, and so he was a big part of my dream. Um, another concept is the vision. Vision to see what Stafford could be, what Stafford could be again. Um, so all these components made me say, you know what, this is a destination town already. So I bring back now the people that I met during my stay here. I've been here for six months now, and the people that I met. I have met wonderful people coming into my store, supporting me, uh, coming and respecting what I, I bring to the table. And every day I keep saying to myself, wow, I'm pretty proud of this. Um, which makes me uh, go to the next step, which is really what the members of Main Street want. We want to make sure that we can cherish and nurture something that already exists in, in staff. We don't have to start from scratch. We don't have to rebuild something different. We have to work what we have, which is a beautiful town. I, every time I, I, during the day, when I'm, I'm slow, I open the door and I look both ways in downtown, and I say, wow, this is awesome. Um, <laughs> um, so, members of the, uh, the Main Street Business Association uh, paved the way for someone like me to be able to come up with a dream, which was opening the store, something I've been planning for a long time. And they paved the way. People like Kathy in, in the middle ground, Lisa in two graces, uh, Renee in, um, in the Arsons Corner. They all came together and they saw, saw that there were a lot of resources here, a lot of value here, especially artists. I'm an artist myself, and it's so great to be surrounded by great artists. And they had the vision to get together and start showing artwork, which then morphed into Arts and Many, which is a wonderful, wonderful. Um, event that uh, we have in Main Street. And every time we have one, I see people coming from all over. Um, we have been involved, uh, Radio 104, Renee from Ars um, Arsons Corner last year, put something together, we worked together, and she put an amazing event. And I've heard from a lot of people that it was an event that's brought more, more people to town that they've seen. I have a cute little story to share. During that event, a woman, uh, people from Stafford, she must have been about 85 years old, and she came to the store. I never met her. She came to me, she gave me a big hug. And I said, oh, I'm doing something wrong. I said, great. Uh, I'm thinking, why should I have a store? Don't you want to be She said to me, I've been in staff for my whole life, and I have not walked downtown for 10 years. I walked downtown today, and I'm so proud of my family. I, <laughs> I just couldn't tell you. That was probably the best way to tell me, hey, you're in the right place again. Um, 
So that was where you want to pour. Trick or treat. We, uh, the association, uh, association started the trick or treat. And uh, last year, I mean this year, we had over 800 kids coming through. It was amazing. I've never seen something like that. And I hear the last year was like a thousand kids. So uh, I, it was just so amazing to see so many kids in town. So uh, I'm looking forward to next year already. Um, Rediscover Stafford. That's something we got together. And uh, we got, gather a lot of people, business people from town. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to say, come to Stafford. People that either want to open a business, people that might be able to help somebody open a business, let's come together and help other people make that dream. And I tell you, Stafford made it easy for me. I, I, I'm like a poster child for being able to open a business in such an easy way. And a lot of people could do the same. And we want to make sure that we can encourage that so we can uh, have our town, which is destination town already, become a bigger destination town. Um, so I want to make sure that everybody, uh, if you guys want to uh, be part of our, our group, our business association group, please stop at one of the stores and, and sign up because we want to start uh, having more members, more um, uh, business members, not just downtown, in Stafford. And what we want to do is learn from you. There are a lot of you that might be here that have businesses that have been here forever. We want to learn from you. Maybe you can share something that will help us improve uh, and become better business men and women here in town. Um, so I think that's uh, pretty much what we have. Uh, thank you again, Stafford, for allowing someone like me to be able to make a dream come true. Thank you.